very happy to introduce Enrique Traver from Brazil. Enrique Traver is 60 years old. He's a Spanish resident since ever in Brazil. He's married with Sule Traver. They are five children, five grandchildren. He is an economist and a lawyer. And he's reading the Urancia book since 2010. He's the president of the Urancia Association in Brazil. Okay, she, she was very nice because she said M60, but M66. 66, okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, this, this is last chance for those who want to escape from this, okay? <laughs> if you stay here, you have to stay up to the end. Okay, let's go there. Well, I'm really pleased to be with you all here. It's my first time here at the Urantia Foundation. I'm so impressed and delighted. Oh my God, this is wonderful. Being on the place where everything has started. So thanks for inviting me and thanks for giving me this chance to talk a little bit of, about our wonderful country, Brazil. I was born in Spain but uh, I'm living in Brazil longer than most of the Brazilians. So I feel more Brazilian than most of the Brazilians. <laughs> so I have a Brazilian wife and five children, which are Brazilian, and also five grandchildren. So uh, I have been involved in the agro-industry, um, agriculture, on the past 45 years. So that has required me to travel a lot through Brazil. So I've been in places where uh, many of the Brazilians will have no idea they exist. So uh, I have been in touch with uh, uh, people from companies, from government, from the schools, from the field, workers uh, in the industry, everything. So all, all this uh, network that I, I had the chance to be involved in Brazil gave me the chance to have a very good overview of Brazil and its people. This certainly is, is, not, is not the vision. Perhaps the vision I have is not the vision that most Brazilians have about Brazil. And, but this is my perception, my honest perception. Uh, and obviously, I am not authorized to talk on behalf of them. i have just given my opinion here about what Brazil is. Yeah. And I hope this is uh, pretty much in line with what the reality of the country is. Uh, Brazil, I, I didn't make a, a a picture of the map of Brazil, but Brazil is in the South America, for those who doesn't want, don't, don't know, and is the fifth large country in the world, just a little bit smaller than U.S. and a little bit bigger than Australia. So it's the fifth large country in the world. Brazil is also the second uh, large producer of agri-products in the world, just after U.S. And although many of the news in the world says that Brazil is destroying environment now, Brazil produce, is the second largest, largest producer of uh, agri-products in the world, but it uses only 7%, only 7% of its territory to produce what it produces. So there are many stories that we are destroying the forest, destroying our, yes, it's true, the forest uh, once in a while is being destroyed by people that wants to take the wood and things like that. But farmers in Brazil are very conscious, so. Uh, we only have 7% of our territory dedicated to the agribusiness. And Brazil alone will be capable to feed the entire world, the entire world. So uh, if we stop producing anywhere in the world, Brazil alone will be able to produce everything we need to eat. Even if we grow up to 10 billion habitants. So that wouldn't be a problem. Also, we are very lucky because we have one of the 
uh, most uh, rich, the richest uh, uh, natural uh, things in the world. So we have, uh, we are, we have, uh, Brazil is the second on the uh, forest uh, as a country because the Amazon forest is part of Brazil, but it, it is not only in Brazil. It, the Amazon forest goes through Colombia, Peru, uh, Venezuela, etc. So when you look at Amazon, it is really the biggest forest in the world. But as a country, Brazil is the second one. It's been, the first one is Russia. So, and we also have the highest level of uh, uh, fresh water in the world. The second one is one third of what Brazil has. So we have the best lands in the world. There could be some other also as good as Brazil. But there are very few countries in the world that can produce three crops in the same piece of land in the same year. So Brazil, U.S. produces a lot, but U.S. is only able to produce one crop per year. Brazil is able to produce three per year in the same piece of land. Indeed, most of the farmers in Brazil, they grow two crops. Normally, soybeans and corn. Anyway, we also are the eighth economy in the world. Brazil is 210 million people. It's one also of the largest uh, populated countries in the world. So although we are the eighth economy in the world, people in Brazil in general is very poor. Uh, and uh, the, the bad management, the bad politicians we had in the past 500 years in Brazil uh, was not capable to take a, a rich country like that to the place where it should be. So we missed many opportunities and we're still missing those opportunities. And I hope someday we really find a leader that can place Brazil as it deserves. It's a multicultural, multicultural uh, country. We have people from everywhere there. Uh, so we have people from uh, North America, from uh, North America means everybody, Canada, US, Mexico, Central America, Europe, Africa, Asia, everywhere. There, there's people from everywhere in Brazil. So uh, it's a multicultural, multicultural country and uh, the people there is very receptive. Now. So, I though, although I didn't make any uh, good picture of Brazil, a map here, so it's not difficult to see it on the, uh, any map. You take a look at that, you're going to see it there. So it takes 47% of the South America territory. So, okay. Let's talk a little bit about our modern religion in Brazil or culture. The native Indians were the original inhabitants in Brazil. The culture is still is present in our civilization there. So uh, you see people mainly on the Northeast area, they still using sleeping nets for sleeping on their houses. Uh, and most of the people are use it to use uh, natural plants to cure their diseases. As well, they believe uh, they, their beliefs and, and Quakers, uh, bad spirits, etc. They believe in many of those things that uh, were introduced by the natives in Brazil and still are present on the Brazilian uh, culture. Brazil was uh, discovered, let's say, uh, by Portuguese and was colonized by Portuguese. And the Portuguese introduced the Catholicism in Brazil. Uh, today, Brazil is the uh, most populated country, uh, Catholic country. So uh, there is no other country uh, like Brazil in terms of Catholicism. It's the biggest one. So these uh, Christian beliefs and uh, rites 
uh, are very strong within our population. Also during the colonization period, uh, the Portuguese brought from Africa a lot of slaves. So those slaves, they had a strong presence then in Brazil, and today uh, they represent 51% of the population. So they mix it with the population there, and 51% of the population, they are uh, descendants of those slaves or being uh, uh, mixed with natives or Portuguese or any other uh, in the country. So, but 51% of the population today in Brazil has a strong blood from Africa. And the, one of their culture in terms of religion, they have introduced in, in the country a religion. I don't know if the name in, in Africa is the same, but in Brazil we call Umbanda and Candomblé, which are rites of, uh, you know, uh, and, and cults that they have together for praying together, dancing, canting, and other things. But, other immigrants brought, uh, brought to the country other Christian denominations, uh, such as the Lutherans, the Evangelicals, and disseminated them in Brazil. Spiritism. This is uh, the Spiritism coming from Alain Kardec, uh, the French guy. Uh, he, he, uh, this Spiritism is being developed in the country for about about maybe the same time as Zuran Chabur, but it's growing very fast. And one of the basic ideas of the Spiritism is reincarnation. So you, you come, you, you die, and you get back to correct things you have done wrongly, and you have one more chance to fix it and to learn it, and then this cycle keeps going on forever until you are perfect here on this piece of land. Anyway, and the other thing is that uh, on the spirit is that the spirits can talk with you after someone dies, can come to talk and communicate with you. And some of them are good and some of them are bad. So you have to be careful. You know? And th those kinds of things are, are well spread through the country. And although uh, very few Brazilians declare themselves as being a spirit. Uh, this is the second or third or fourth or fifth uh, religion for, for the Brazilians. Most of the Brazilians, most of the population, believes in reincarnation. So that's uh, it's a, almost a consensus in the country. Okay. All these traditions and beliefs are challenges for many readers to completely accept and adopt the Urantia book yeah, as the real truth. So they, many of the Brazilians uh, feel the need to believe, but they feel the need to, to, the need to believe in supernatural beings. They need to see you know, uh, supernatural things that can help them to address their problems. Yeah. Uh, so for them, uh, uh, a possibility, for many of them, a possibility of a religion that has not aid of a spirit or a, a, a prayer or a church or whatever uh, may not be helpful to prevent these spirits, to prevent bad luck, to prevent uh, uh, all the bad things that can happen in their life. Now, and many of those beliefs in Brazil they are unconscious. So if you ask someone uh, if uh, he's superstitious, uh, probably the answer will be no. But he probably will not use clothes of one specific color. Probably he's carrying an amulet. Probably he's no. And his office has a pot of uh, salt or maybe a stone that gives energy on the office and things like that. But he's not superstitious, OK? This is natural <laughs> things, OK? Okay, actions and events to justify, so they need to believe in supernatural beings, actions and events that to justify their misery and their day-to-day -day problems and to find protection against them all. 
this traditionally side, tradi traditionally sided and dogmatized and institutionally sided cultural education concept is the target for changes and certainly the biggest challenge of the teachings. I think Brazil is not too much different than most of the countries. Uh, maybe in some sense, yes. But in all the countries, people have their own beliefs. And they beliefs are they true. Uh, uh, so that when they are confronted on those true, uh, they trend always on the first moment to reject it. Or like the Brazilians do with the Urantia book, well, this is wonderful. But this page here, I don't like it. I'm going to escape it and move to this next one because this specific page is against my beliefs. Mm. Or there must be another explanation for this uh, uh, page here. Or maybe what is the true, the revelators didn't want it to tell us. <laughs> right? Because this true is not my true. Uh, so, they go according to their convenience. So that's why I said it's very difficult to, to, to cultivate a, a Christian uh, person to the Urantia book, mainly if that person is too religious and too connected to the old traditions. Yeah. Uh, we, the church has done, doesn't matter if it's evangelic or uh, Catholic, whatever, but they have done a so strong job, uh, a so strong brainwash, that people believe in things that they even don't stop to think about. Uh, so if you say to an uh, uh, evangelic that, you know, uh, Jesus never came to the, the, the earth, to, with his blood, to save us and to, give, to, to pacify our relationship with God, you're gonna find, you're gonna be in a big trouble if you tell a Christian that. So this, they, they don't agree with that. that. They have another reason why Jesus came. You know? And uh, the same thing when we talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus, he, she was virgin. How come she was not virgin? You know? And a lot of things that we see there. So uh, when you read in the book the life of Jesus without knowing all the rest of the revelations, yeah, it's wonderful because we all are in love with Jesus. Uh, we all uh, get magnetized by that personality and we say, Jesus, I want to be like that, right? Which is wonderful. Nothing wrong about that. But normally, the people escape from those pages that are against their belief. Now, there's a piece there on the fourth part where Jesus says, forget about astrology, or uh, forget about uh, uh, the cards, forget about, uh, you know, and so on. And they say, no, 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 this page is not bad, this page is wrong. No. I have to see my horoscope uh, to every day. And I have to see what the cards tell me. I have to see, to, you know. So those things, people normally react very strongly ab about that. You know? And why is that? Why is that? Because that's against the truth, they believe. You know? And more important than, than that is because they don't know the Father. Uh, people in general, are very familiarized with Jesus. Uh, so, but they, they have no idea about our Father. Most of us, the idea we have, as I said before, is a Father which is carrying a book where he's taking notes of all the mistakes and things we do. Then to apply a punishment for us, right? So, and there is no place in the world or where our Father is being revealed, is being exposed on its nature like it is done on the Urantia book. So a person that studies the Father in the Urantia book and understands why he did this big creation, 
why we all are here, why he expect, what he is expecting from us. No? Uh, is incapable then to maintain some of the beliefs we have on the other hand. No? It's very hard to accept the idea, if you know your father, to accept that our father provoked and wanted the death of Jesus the way it happened. So we believe it was a salvation and was a purpose of the father of death when we don't know the father, right? So, okay, let's keep moving on. I cannot get too much enthusiastic about here, so that's it. <laughs> Uh, so, Catholicism and Invalidism is, is in, uh, among uh, others, the largest incorporated Christianity in Brazil culture. 89% of the Brazilians are culture, are, are Christians. However, as I said, Brazilians are syncretic. The syncretism is the idea of having as many religions as you want to. Uh, so all of them declare themselves as being Catholic or whatever, but then they have a second, third, or fourth uh, religion. In our group, we had a person there that uh, said, okay, I'm a student now of uh, uh, the Urantia book, but after our meeting, the person left to, to go to the uh, evangelic church and then uh, after that, uh, she went to the uh, Spiritism section and things like that. So most of the Brazilians normally, they have more than one religion. Okay, so the, all of them have this uh, syncretism and uh, uh, most of them, no matter what religion they follow, independently of the religion they believe on the reincarnation. About 8% declare themselves as atheists. Uh, yes. Religion has handicapped uh, the social development in Brazil like it did in many other countries. So for sure, uh, religion was a great thing in Brazil when we started up the country to give some order, to give some uh, uh, general organization to the society, etc. But the truth is that the country is stopped on the past century. Yeah. Uh, we still are attached to old beliefs and old things that prevent, uh, prevents us from growing, from developing from where we are. Most of the Brazilians believe and are God-fearing, but syncretism is their major characteristic, as I have said. Uh, they of, often they are unconsciously superstitious, uh, as I said. They seek the source of prosperity and loving happiness and rites and religions, as well as a tool to prevent evil spirits and bad luck. And chance is for them a method of bad luck or good luck, always influenced by the person's own energy, beliefs, and attitudes. So for them, it's very difficult to accept a natural event. They always have to find or identify a cause behind that, and that cause often is a situation that involves a bad luck or a, go a, a, a good luck, or an action or an attitude of the individual that caused it and promoted that situation. Most Brazilians believe they had a previous life, obviously, because they believe in reincarnation. And that previous life may be the cause for their miseries, and this justified the lack of talents and skills, as well as the challenge they need to overcome in the present life. Some religions, and this is more specifically to the Universal Church, which is an evangelic religion, is a church, proposed to bargain prosperity and happiness and even heaven if you give them a great contribution uh, to the church, you know, for sure. 
this has conquered a growing mass of faithful in Brazil. So it's a growing religion in Brazil, and uh, people like the idea of uh, you know changing uh, the the healthy their prosperity in life. They're having a car. It's common to see in Brazil a car running on the street, and they, it says a gift from Jesus, right? Or a house, it's a, a gift from Jesus. Yeah. And then, obviously, that person has paid something to the church pro, to, to, to receive that gift from Jesus or from whoever. No? So, uh, there are many religions that openly, many churches that openly invites people to donate against a benefit, uh, material or spiritual. Uh, but they don't ask to donate. It is not say, come here and give me whatever you can. No, no, no. Give me 10,000 reals. And then you, 10,000 reals means one year wage for many Brazilians. Yeah. No, if you want to be successful, you, get, you have to give me 10,000 reals. And those announcements go on the radio, on the TV. Yeah. And people is paying for that. Yeah. So obviously, it's not all the Brazilians, but many Brazilians are convinced that if they give a, a contribution to the church at the amount the church is asking for, they will be successful. And Okay, let's move on. So the culture in Brazil is largely impacted by, by religion. Uh, you see the presence of religion on architectural aspects, sculptures, paintings, clothing colors. There are, there are places in Brazil that only use white color clothes. Um, in Bahia, for instance, uh, there are many uh, people that only use white. They don't use the other, other color because white is part of the religion. Okay, uh, they use amulets, objects, reeds, music, dancing, praying, philosophy, cures, luck, success, etc. In general, Brazilians are seek seekers, and that's the good part of it. So all of the Brazilians, most of them, are seekers. They are always looking for something new. You know, they are always open for a new religion. They are always open for understanding better uh, what is the divine, what's the paradise, what is, uh, you know, how they can improve their spirituality, etc. And obviously, this is an opportunity to introduce Durante a book. However, an approach strategy is needed for the student to understand the teachings before the concept of the true personal religion is acquired and consolidated. And this requires training for leaders and instructors as a key. One of the problems we have in Brazil, I'm talking about that a little bit more, is Brazilians are not good readers. I heard here some others saying, okay, everybody in the country or most of the populations like to read. Now, Brazil is a country that uh, doesn't like to read. And there is several explanations for that. But most of the, the students, the new readers of the book, they heard about the book and they get interested. So what they, they do is they read three or four pages of one specific document, sometimes the rebellion, or sometimes uh, Adam and Eve, uh, sometimes uh, whatever. But, and then they get cited about that little piece they have uh, read and they look for someone else to share it, but they want someone else that can give them the rest of the book. So they want, don't want to read the book, so they want to be in a study group where you keep discussing document by document. So many Brazilians are students, many students of the Urantia book, they are that way. They participate on the study groups, they like to be on the study groups, uh, and, and they like to be discussing that but they don't take the, re the, the book themselves to read and stu study to, to come to their own conclusions. Yeah. So then take years for a person 
to get familiarized with most of the documents uh, involved with Tom Durante's book. And then we have a mistake, because then often on, on those study groups, we discuss reincarnation. We discuss um, Mary virginity. We discuss, and those things always cause problem because the people doesn't understand that. Uh, they have, as I said, they have their beliefs. So if you didn't study the Father and other things before, when you go into those discussions, uh, normally that is useless, and often you have one less lead reader of the book because they say, well, that's not for me. That, that can be true. No. So besides, we have several conflicts and fights between students because they start debating that. And uh, you know, there are those that are the guardians of the book. No, the book is, uh, you, you, I have to defend the book myself. No. So and then the problems becomes to increase and, 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 and can, is even worse. So, discussing that event subject, uh, that's uh, what I just said, sorry about that. Here I have a, a short graphic about how religion is distributed in, in, in Brazil. Those are the official numbers, but I, as, as I said, many of the Brazilians, they have three, four, or five religions. You know? So Catholic by far is the largest uh, population. No religion is 12 million. Then uh, assemblies uh, and others, uh, you know, you see, uh, there is a growing uh, population involved with, with uh, evangelical religions or others. Okay. About personal religion in Brazil, the concept of a pre personal religion in Brazil uh, is, is very limited. Now, most of the population, they believe that having a personal uh, religion is belonging to an institution, to a church, to something. So uh, uh, they they have to they have to belong to something. If they say I'm a Catholic, then then I have a personal religion. If uh, I'm evangelist, uh, I have a personal religion. So. This is one of the problems. At the same time, you know, they, although they, 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 they like the idea of developing a new religion to understand better their life, they always have the need to be part of a specific community. So when we go into discussions of personal religions according to what's uh, uh, it is on the Urantia book. Uh, then we get into another discussion. So is the Urantia book a religion or not? And if it is a religion, is a personal religion, how come? So my religion is the book, it's only my religion or is a religion for everybody? Or is not a religion? Right? Should be the church or not? Those discussions goes long and long and often is exhaustive to uh, try to explain to people uh, what really the Rancha book is and how you find your own religion, you know, studying the book. So many of the good students in Brazil of the Rancha book, even the old ones, they still have the need to go to a church. And many of them, they are participating on the Catholics or Evangelic Church, and they go with their family because they feel uh, this is good and uh, it's interesting for them and for their families. Uh, they have the sense that, that they are part of the community, etc. So um, it's, it's amazing how, how that progresses among the students of the Urantia book. The evolution of culture. Brazil is a young country. The cultural influence of the native remains present in many ways in the Brazilian life. So we had the Christian culture introduced by the Portuguese. 
we had the slaves coming from uh, Brazil, 51% of the population today is coming from those people. In general, Brazilians are very conservative, trapped to Christian and other religions, ideas, and rites. Social and cultural advances are difficult to achieve. So this can be noticed in legal issues like abortion. It takes uh, maybe over 50 years discussion in Brazil about abortion. It's not ended yet. Now, divorce was another issue in Brazil. You know, uh, in genetic engineering, uh, it's another big discussion in Brazil. Uh, so, and we never find the, the, the solution for overcoming those problems and those ideas. And marriage is another problem. So what is a legal marriage or not? Now we have this innovation with the uh, gays or whatever marriage. And uh, so this is really innovation in Brazil. This is already approved by the law. But uh, the people, the society in general, is still is very reluctant to, elect, uh, to accept those things. You know. uh, another problem is the participation of the woman in the society you know, and in the economy. You know. uh, so it's, it's a very, very traditional country in terms of secular institutions and cultural ideas that belongs to maybe two centuries ago. And uh, it's difficult to change those ideas in Brazil. <coughs> As well, you know, the same problem happens in the country, not just uh, socially speaking, but in terms of economy. Brazil remains a very protective uh, country and a very close to imports and other things. Investment in science and technology are restricted and the economy remains very dependent from the agriculture and other commodities with a large participation and interference from the state. On the other hand, being a syncretic people, they are very open. You know? So although all those difficulties they still are open for new religion. Education is still a limiting factor with many analphabets, uh, the illiterates you now, and functional analphabets. Uh, functional analphabets, we call those people that are able to read, but they are not able to understand what they are reading. So you give them a paragraph, they can read all the words, but they don't know what the meaning of that paragraph is. You know. In addition, there is a large population that has only completed elementary school in average of poor quality. This combined it with a large number of unemployment and other social diseases, diseases has limited Brazil cultural growth, enlarging the gap between us and developed countries. In terms of family, family is important from Brazilians, however, this importance has diminished with the event of uh, the, the approval for the divorce. Every year we have an increasing number of divorces. And also this is a, a result of the recent woman conquer on earning economic independence and other fresh social changes in the world. Now, fa Brazilian family laws had a paternalist orientation now with a very strong hierarchy, with the man being the leader and provider and the woman responsible for housekeeping and children's education. The most recent regulation from 2002 established the same rights and duties for both of the couple. Today, many families are raised and maintained exclusively by one of the parents. Many women are caring alone with their families. The Brazilian family also suffers from many modern dysfunctions, such as drug addiction. Brazil is getting deeply involved with drugs. This has been a, a deep problem and very important problem. Uh, infant prostitution, we have the prostitution of children in Brazil is unbelievable. Domestic violence, 
parents absence in the children education today. It happens in other countries as well. No? So the parents doesn't want to get involved on the education of the children. They feel the school or the society are responsible for that. And the parents just keep away doing everything the kids want. They just want to get rid, uh, uh, away from the problems of the kids. And they don't want to get involved on the, in the education. So this is uh, uh, typical of many uh, modern societies. The lack of spiritual introdu introduction and development. When I, I was a child, um, my father and my mother took me to the church every single uh, Sunday, if not more. And that was the same for all my uh, brothers and sisters. And I did the same with my son and my, my, my children. So we were used to go to the church or do something and learn that there is a father, there is a religion. Today, most of the families don't have that habit of you know, praying together with uh, the sons or the daughters or having them involved in the spirituality. So they basically live in hands of the children to decide whatever they want to do. So this, this, for me, is a problem, I think. And there is also too much exposure to the internet and technology. So Brazil accounts for the fourth or fifth country in terms of uh, people addicted to the internet. But uh, with a low culture, low education, this is not something good. It's in the bad. Uh, it's uh, because uh, many people is looking on the internet for things that really doesn't help them to grow. Uh, so this is a problem. And uh, innovation has also changed the face in the family with the same-sex marriage, as I said before. Still talking about the family. The families are set, certainly passing through a challenging uh, transition period. We are moving from the existing hierarchized uh, society, which exploited and diminished the, the woman, but at the same time forced families, families for being together as a unit. Uh, I'm not saying this was right. It's just a situation we had before. Because one way or other, the family was, was forced to stay together because the woman had no chance to get to have their independence, to, to get away from the man. And the man has the responsibility to maintain the family. It was a shame if he was not able to do so. So somehow the families, like or not, they, they, they had to stay together. Yeah. So once uh, this hierarchy is gone, and uh, now with the new uh, relation we have with the independence of the woman, the same rights, uh, woman and man, etc., uh, has changed the idea of the old family. Yeah? Uh, I think we are passing through this transition period, and this can be quite dangerous because certainly we have a find, to find a way of rebuilding a way for a family to stay together, to maintain the unity. Uh, today, the way we are, we are getting away from that. And this is maybe one of the big challenges uh, for, for overcoming this, this drastic uh, difference we have from uh, biological, physical conditions, and the difference on the mental process and uh, development of the spirituality. The book itself, it reminds us, they even, our superiors, they even don't understand how man and woman can stay together. Uh, so they say it's a challenge, right? We are so different in many aspects. Yeah. And unfortunately, our culture, our education, has not helped it too much for us to understand those differences and to come along with a uh, common sense on how we can do and perform better together, 
rather than being fighting each other. Uh, so I think in a moment we will have to find a way how, how we overcome this disruption. People today are very focused on self-gratification. Also, this is something coming from the book. You know. uh, the family needs uh, self-perpetuation, self-maintenance, and self-gratification. So we need the three elements present to maintain the family. Preservation, maintenance, and gratification. If those three elements are not there, it's going to be difficult for the family to stay as a unit. So, and today we are looking often for self-gratification, not just the matter of sex, but also you know, professional success, independence, freedom, whatever. We, we, we can call it the way we want to. But in that, we are, we are becoming more egoist, I think. Thinking about we as a person, as an individual, rather than uh, being a member of the society, of the family, and taking responsibilities of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, being together. So I think this transition we're passing through is very dangerous. And this is affecting seriously the family in Brazil, I think, like it does in, in several other countries. So in the book, 68 to 11, it, there is a, a small uh, sentence there that self-maintenance builds society. Unbridled self-gratification unfairly destroys civilization. Uh, so, and this is the risk we have in now with this increased self-gratification uh, pursued by most of the people uh, in our society today. So the value of the woman in our culture. I was surprised that Peru is so good, wonderful. I, I, uh, I had her be in Peru. <laughs> Anyway, women are 52% of the Brazilian population, and they are about the same in number of electors, but their participation in politics is between 10 to 15% of the political position in the country. Brazil hangs for the fifth country in violence toward women, accounting for 13 femicides per day. Per day. Okay. Brazil has grown under a patriarchal and sexist culture. Women have reached their maximum expression in the country as mother. For many years, they were limited to housekeeping function and were prohibited from working and limited in their studies, either by their husband, by the families, or the society. Today, that has been changing, but oh, more recently, the women have achieved more independence and they are gradually earning a relevant role in the local culture. Today, nearly 38% of all families are sustained by women in Brazil. Although that they still are, there still are difference in wage restrictions for women to take higher or top leading positions in the company or in the government. In general, Brazilian women are more educated. They perform better at school than men. This has certainly helped to sl slowly ele elevate the woman and the Brazilian culture, which remains very chauvinist. Okay, the status of education in our culture. Brazilian population is about 210 million, as I said. The adult population, o over 15 years up to 60, about 130 million, accounts for 7% analphabets which are 9.1 million. 29% uh, of adult population is defined as functional analphabets. 50% of the population only completed the fundamental school or the elementary school. So 26.3% have completed secondary school and only 15.3% have completed college. 
about 11 million, 23% of young adults between 15 and 29, they don't work and they neither do study. So it's a massive amount of uh, young people doing nothing, staying at home because uh, they don't have opportunities or they don't like studying. And this is one of the examples of the absence of the parents in home, at home, uh, on, you know, being supervised and what their children are doing. The unemployment rate is 12%, nearly 13 million people, but that does not include the 5.5 million of people just, that just gave up searching for a job because they simply say, okay, it's impossible to find a job, I will give up because the pools are done for those that are seeking for a job. So there are 12, 12 and a half million seeking for a job, but 5.5 million just gave up. You know? uh, we also have about 24 million workers uh, on the informal economy. So the biggest contingent of all those are young adults or old aged people. So about 42.5 million people is excluded or marginalized from the economical world, about 42% of the active economic or active population in Brazil. And that explains also violence in Brazil, criminality, uh, and, and also the degradation of uh, the society in some aspects. Uh. Public education in Brazil has deteriorated in quality and there is a big discussion about ideology being introduced on the schools, many from left parties. Uh, there are many people that believe that Mr. Lula was a good uh, president for, for Brazil. And uh, we, I heard here someone saying, okay, the actual president is, is uh, maybe a dictator. And none of them are right. No. So, uh, the left part, he caused many problems in Brazil. Uh, the economy is being diverted in many different ways. And the money of the, the, the country is being used, uh, misused for some not very clear purposes. I'll give just one example. So uh, during the uh, left party mandate, uh, we had, we hired 10,000 doctors from Cuba to, to serve the Brazilian population. That was fantastic, genial, bringing doctors from outside for going to a place where we don't have a doctor to place so, and paying them a salary. But the problem was that two-thirds of that salary was paid to Mr. Uh, Cuba, Castro in Cuba and one third remain with the doctor there. So in that, that was a way for sourcing money from Brazil to help sustaining uh, a regime in Cuba. The same thing happened in Venezuela during the left party or in other Latin America countries. We were talking about corruption. So you guys probably have heard about corruption a lot in Brazil. Yeah? We have a very strong task force trying to, disturb, to destroy the corruption there. And there were some few companies involved on that. And those few companies working together with the politicians in Brazil. And those few companies were financed by Brazilian government through the, the official bank to promote uh, 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 constructions in other countries like Venezuela, Peru, and some others uh, with Brazilian money with an excuse for those companies to pay the bribe for the local politicians and help them to be elected. So uh, this system was not just a corruptive system, it was a system implemented to uh, get source and financing to develop a unique system, a unique politi political system on the left side in all Latin America. 
and that included also some countries from Africa. So this is what this uh, uh, corruption task force has been revelating to us in Brazil. Okay. So. Some of your great dissemination ideas, which I'm sure are going to be beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I will escape from this. Uh, well, Brazilians like uh, football and uh, other uh, uh, distractions. Uh, they are TV addicted and they watch a lot for uh, soap opera in Brazil are very common. Unfortunately, the, those soap opera, they don't have a constructive way for the society in that is more destroying than helping to construct. Popular art is appreciated in Brazil, but theater and museums are not popular art. Cinema is also popular, and the Brazilian state has a specific program, Ruane Law, to finance cultural programs and projects, but there is much talk about misusage of that program to finance things that really don't contribute to the cultural uh, area of Brazil. Brazil is a young capitalist democracy with a very long way to go. So uh, the paternalist culture in Brazil conflicts with that democracy. So people want to be dependent from the government. Um, okay, this, the language we spoke there is very easy in, in terms of we don't have too many languages. There's only one, it's Portuguese. It's the na national language, official language there. Books in Brazil are tax-free, so we can import books from everywhere in Brazil, and we can find the Urantia book in Brazil at a price maybe sometimes of $15. But it can go up to $40. It still is cheap compared to other Latin American destinations. So distribution in Brazil uh, often is, is more expensive than buying the book itself. So. We have a system for donating the books in Brazil, but that system uh, is limited on the amount of money we are able to, able to capture from our donators. And I think sharing books is the best way to disseminate it, as, to forst, forst, as it is fostering the study groups. So we need to have books available and accessible. Sometimes it's difficult to find them in Brazil because the big stores don't have them available in stock. So they, you have to wait for them to import it. Ideally, we should be importing ourselves. Uh, works, workbooks should be available as well, if it's possible, because of the low instruction of many Brazilians and to help to understand the, the, the concepts of uh, you know, the Urantia book and the teachings. If we have workbooks available on an easy explanation of some specific topics, this could be very good. Video lessons and classes could help a lot also. Uh, one idea is to develop some specific sequences of uh, videos uh, to talk about uh, specific documents that can give a good overview of the Urantia book, mainly for those that are not good readers and prefer to hear and, and watch to, to capture the idea of the so, interacting with the executive associations on actions to distribute the books, developing workbooks or trading is desirable. So, if we can um, together develop you know, a specific training or specific workbooks, uh, that's going to be very interesting. So, there are some Face, few face-to-face -face groups in Brazil. I think we have about 10,000 readers in Brazil. That's my estimate. But we only have 12 registered. Yeah, 10,000. Uh, some of the face-to-face -face groups combines their meeting with virtual Zoom participants. <laughs> Our group does that. There are virtual meetings via Zoom every day of the week. Some more experienced leaders usually pay a visit to the study groups to motivate them with tips for straightening the group. The most experienced group occasionally participates via Zoom on the meetings with other groups to support, learn, teach, and motivate them. So sometimes we put together two or three groups via uh, Zoom, and then they share their common experience and things like that. So that's it. 
I hope I was not too exhaustive. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. It was a great presentation. Um, now we have a chance to ask questions of this very stimulating um, presenter. So, <laughs> yes. First, I would like to say congratulations for the presentation. It's not easy to speak about Brazil. As you say, Brazil is a very, very big country, uh, a mix of field, different, many different people and cultures. Uh, it's not uh, by chance that uh, a passport of... Yes, that a passport of Brazil, Brazil is so disputed that uh, because you know that you can have any face of this world with a passport of Brazil. Well, if we call here 10 different people to talk about Brazil, we have 10 different communications. You know that we have a problem with our statistical tools, are not the so, so true so words. And then we have difficult. There are a lot of numbers that when we say the people, the people is stunted, surprised. But uh, our ourselves, we don't uh, not have so. Sh we are not so sure about this number. But it's our country, which is a very, very big country. You know that we have a lot of uh, study group in Brazil, and uh, we have in Curitiba, São Paulo, Belo Horizonte, Salvador, my city, and the. Uh, there is a little difficult the communication. You know this, you are president. I would like to know a little about your plan for the integration from this group. For example, in Salvador, we have three different groups. I talk with this group, I want to stimulate to, to take contact with you, with the association in Brazil, to are together work that is good for the country. But they, they don't have success until now. Maybe you can explain about, a little about this difficulty and when you can do it. Well, I don't know what the difficulty for the Brazilians are to, to reach the association. We have a site on, on the web. We have uh, the study groups spread out to some of the groups that are on the WhatsApp, for instance. They have members uh, like uh, 180 members in one group, which is not desirable. But anyway, it's just to say there are groups that are so big and so spread out in Brazil uh, that it's easy to, to contact any of those persons and say, hey, I want to be together in your group. You know? So I think it's uh, certainly a communication problem. How we overcome that is a challenge. Brazil is a big country. And it's difficult for me or for any member of the association to identify where a reader or a new group is. Uh, it's easier for the group or for the person to come to the association once we have the website uh, to, to talk with us. Besides that, uh, if, if you type my name on the internet, you find my address, my phone, everything. It's easy to contact me. You know? it's, uh, it's just type Enrique Traver there, you will find thousand pages talking about my numbers and what <coughs> we do, how can I help, etc. You know? So, uh, what I suggest is that you tell your groups to contact us, uh, because I don't know them. Uh, they have to show up their faces. No. Thank you. Next question. Yes, Claire. Yeah, you say you have 10,000 leaders all over uh, Brazil. Uh, it seems a long time. They are all leader. When did it start? We don't have any official number about that. We have a. Uh, 3,650 uh, readers registered at the association. Uh, this file was lost once we rebuilding it. But by the number of uh, you know, approaches I receive every day coming from everywhere, 
I estimate that the number of readers in Brazil are at least three times the number of re registered people. That is just an estimation. Can be even more that. I don't think we have that, uh, that amount of books in Brazil. Many of them have uh, maybe get uh, download from the internet for their books. Uh, but there is a high demand for books. It's many people coming every day asking for a book. Yes, Marta. Um, you mentioned in terms of personal religion that the people want to have a sense of belonging and that they want a sense of community. And I'm just thinking in terms of, of all of the talks that have been given and will be given, finding that balance between a personal religion and part of a community. And the, the sense that people want community, whether it's family, extended family, study group, something like that. And so I'm wondering how you and or how we create a sense of community and still support the personal relationship with God as your own personal inner relationship, how you've done it there and, and how we might do it. Well, there are many, many ways that we have to look at that, I think, from my point of view. Uh, uh, I don't have that problem. Uh, no, you are my community. I, I, I feel at home, my, at, at my family home here. And uh, the same thing happens when I am together with my study group. So I have the feeling of belonging, belonging to that family. And within the association, uh, we have all, all our members that are always in touch with us. And yes, I feel that as uh, a family, and I belong to that. As some, when somebody asks me, uh, well, what is your religion? I say it's the fifth revelation. revelation yeah? Because many of the students even don't know what to say about what their religion is. Yeah? So maybe it's, it's not right what I am saying, but, you know, it works for me. Uh, now, uh, it is true that uh, wom women are driven by emotions very often. Uh, and emotion is part of our life. And we like to cry once in a while, even if he's crying for happiness, it's even better, right? So when we go to a church and we, have, we are all singing together and giving our hands and sharing a nice song and we you start crying and say, okay, this is happiness, it's good, I, I feel close to God. And so this is good, it's wonderful. Uh, and if you feel the need to, to, to participate in something like that, you have to, right? We don't have to give up. So participating in other churches is not bad if you feel that helps you, that it gives you, because at the end, we are all seeking for God. We are all seeking for the Father. Now, in the other part, what I see is as we develop and we get more conscious about you know, uh, the fifth revelation, we have a trend to stay together, to seek for those that have found the fifth revelation as us, and to share common things among with them. So for that reason, I think on a long run, we certainly will have our society groups that will get together uh, in a church or whatever, to sing together, to stay together. While this doesn't help, it uh, doesn't happen, what I have done with my group is uh, we pray together, we meditate together, we, we share ideas with, between us, we have a socializing uh, momentum before our meetings where we share experiences, we share doubts, etc. So for me, that is belonging, is staying together. Yeah. And why not uh, singing if we want to, maybe dancing? Okay, this is not a problem. Yeah. 
but I don't like the idea of building up a church. Uh, I am against that. I know many Urantia books students would like maybe to have a place where we can be together singing, take our children there. Uh, this would be un wonderful. But then who handles that? Uh, do we need a pastor? Do we need a bishop or bishop? Or do how we organize the hierarchy, the structure? Uh, if there is a way to escape from that hierarchy and to have something that works by itself, that would be wonderful. But I think we don't have that yet. Anyway, I'm sorry, I don't have the right question for that, the right answer. Well, no, there's probably no right or wrong answers, actually, and I just wanted to say. In the U.S., we, we ran into that maybe, I don't know, 30 years ago, and it was a constant struggle. Are we a church? Are we a religion? Uh, do we have a church? Uh, who Exactly the same thing, and I don't think... Their people are so different who are readers, I think it is very difficult to resolve the issue. And it's good to be cautious of some of the issues resolved, revolved in that because it could very well be that you end up with your hierarchy because that's what people want, the people who tell you what the book means. So anyway, it was a great answer. Thanks. Yes, Sandra. Yeah, um, I, I'm aware of this, this kind of way of of Brazilian people believe in many things at the same time, and this hypotism you were talking about. Um, do you think this, that's uh, like um, a phase in like Brazilian the people? They're going like overview that and and realize, you know, like left some things. It, do you think it's a process, or do you think it's something that is very difficult? It's a process, I think, you know, because uh, you have to perspective, I, I think, you, you have to read the entire book and have a good idea about what the, the book is telling you, what, what, is, what the teachings are, you know, rather than being, uh, you know, uh, preoccupied by the conflicts you have between the teachings and your beliefs. My experience is that when I started reading the Urantia book, I faced a very, a very difficult period. Like uh, Gaetan said yesterday, the teachings were telling me many things that I had to change. And I was not really convinced that I was prepared for that. So I felt the, the, the heavy uh, weight of, of, of the responsibility towards myself of being uh, what I should really be. So it took me maybe a couple of years a very, with a very deep, uh, uh, how to say that, suffering maybe, uh, because I said, well, Jesus. Uh, I am not what I supposed to be, and I have to change everything. And uh, uh, so it was very hard to give up all the things I, I believe and all the things I have built up uh, based on those uh, wrong concepts I had. So, uh, and then I started building up a new person, a new person that has made me perhaps one of the happiest men in the world. So I really feel today I am a son of God. I feel God in my heart all the time. And I feel the need for service, for serving my, my brothers and sisters. And so this is something that you conquer as you grow on the understanding of the teachings. And more than that, I think the most important thing on the teachings, this is for me, maybe it works in a different way for many others, is understanding a little bit about our Father. Uh, I was discussing with uh, 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 
a son in law, which is evangelic, about the Urantia book. So, and among several things we were discussing, you know, because we were discussing about Maria, about Jesus, about said, oh, let's move the subject, let's ch change the subject, let's talk about the universe. And he said, yeah, this is a good discussion. What's the importance for me, he was saying, of knowing that there is seven trillion uh, words in the world, and there is uh, Antonio sitting in uh, X planet in a uh, uh, super universe number one that is doing the same thing I'm doing here. So what's the importance of that? So. I was amazed about the question, but at the same time, I guess, I, I, I got illumination and I said, look, for me, this tells me the power, how, how great, how wonderful my father is. I don't know what the, f the size of your father is. It's if your father is only capable to do this little work we are here, or if this, your father is able to create, maintain, sustain, and coordinate seven trillion uh, words with all its inhabitants and moving them towards him with all the love he gives us. So for me, it's very important to know that my creator is capable of doing that and even more. So he was surprised and said, well, I never thought about that. You know? So, because many people get enthusiastic about the cosmic just because they love astronomy. Okay, it's, it's fine. But for me, it's different. It, it shows me the size, the magnitude of our Father. And when I, uh, you know, realize that this is just a small window in the eternity, I say, wow. What wonderful that's, you know, it's, we are in a little piece of that window on the eternity and we know nothing about the rest, but our Father is maintaining and sustaining all of that, even the things we don't know. So I think those, those teachings are the teachings that have to motivate people because this is not on their minds, this is not on their religions. You know, our, the religions we have today, they don't talk about the Father. They don't talk about the universe. They don't talk about us as a community, a cosmic community. So uh, when you understand the purpose of your Father, it's very hard to believe that the Father will create a situation to have Jesus dying like he did because he wanted to... Uh, uh, you know, resolve the problems between the man and God. So, uh, you don't need to tell anyone that. Once the person knows the Father, he will figure out himself that. So, you don't have to talk about it. Uh, anyway, sorry. No, I'm sorry. I always talk too much. Oh, I know. And it's like, other questions, Would you like to talk a little bit about the books availability or? You have mentioned several times um, people can get books through Amazon, but you also thought maybe uh, there was a need to have them more available. Describe what, what that means. Um, well, if you go to Amazon, you certainly will find the book there. Yeah. But it's not always available to deliver at that moment. Sometimes takes a time. And there are other uh, uh, stores selling the books on, on the Internet. But it always takes a time. It's not always that you go there and the book is available because uh, it's maybe a bestseller on the world, but not bestseller in Brazil yet. So, and then sometimes you don't find it. And uh, uh, sometimes you find it at very cheap price. $15 is cheap. And sometimes it is a little bit more costly, but still is cheap, $40. Now, but for Brazilian purposes, you now Brazil is, is there is a lot of poor people. Fifteen dollars still is too much, and uh, and uh, the whole other problem is the distribution, because uh, sometimes I buy the books and I I have them at home in name of the association, 
because we want to take the opportunity of the price. So that when the price is there, 15 books, we buy 100 books. Okay, then we put it at home. And then uh, people ask for me to deliver the book, and sometimes the, the leave, delivery costs $30 to deliver one book, depending to where you're delivering it. You know? So uh, it's very difficult. Would be good if we could import, uh, I don't say a container of books, maybe 1,000 books, and you no, know, to spread them out. And but 1,000 books maybe is too much for us to pay at one shot, and and uh, pay for the freight, everything to 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 take them to Brazil. Maybe if we had a chance to say, okay, well, you can pay it in four, five, or six times. Uh, then it's better. Uh, we could organize with the donators to, okay, let's pay X amount per month and let's pay for that. No. The importance of bringing one shot a big volume of books is to save cost on the freight. Uh, that, that will help a lot because I think it's going to cost us the same thing for 1,000 books on the freight than it will cost for 100. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, we have to see. Establishing book distribution is very important, and it's always ideal that bookstores will have the books. So it's difficult when, um, I know like in Sao Paulo there's a big bookstore, Livaria Cultura, and they have books. Um, but there's a lot of remote areas and other cities in Brazil where it's hard to get the books. So it's always great if bookstores will you know, if they buy the books and then the readers go and buy them in the stores, then they'll always be encouraged to keep them stocked in the stores. And we have the same problem here in the States as far as shipping. It's really expensive, and I've noticed this year prices are double what they were last year. But it's always, you know, if there's ideas you have, I'm always happy to talk about them, but I'd really encourage you to encourage readers to go to the store. The more the demand is, the more the supply will be there. I think you're right. The problem is that most of those readers, they say, I can't afford buying it. You have to help me and give me one. So it's hard also for us to ensure who really needs to to receive a, a book donated by the association because uh, sometimes they don't have uh, money to buy the book, but they have money to go to the carnival or they have book uh, money to go to the stadium for a, a football game. But anyway, doesn't matter. If someone asks for the, bo the book, if I can, I'll give the book to the person uh, because I cannot ensure that person is not uh, uh, has not the merit to receive that book. And I run the risk of having at least one more reader, uh, if possible, with us. No? So that's it. Uh, but you're right. It, uh, we encourage them to go and buy the book. If they cannot, uh, OK, we'll try to give them. Anyway. <laughs> not a lot. Um, I'm curious, you, you mentioned that Brazilians are not big readers, that they, they tend not to be readers. Uh, are they listeners? Are, are they individuals who would listen to the book on Audible or one of these uh, programs where they read the book to them, where they... Yes, we have, we have an audio. Uh -huh. And that is... Uh, uh, a nice community of uh, listeners to that audio. We're missing part four because the person that was doing that, he wanted different voices for talking, when talking Jesus or all the, the you know, all, all the players on, on the hall. Uh, we were not able to find yet those persons to able to, to, to be together there. But anyway, we have the three parts, the three first parts of the book on the audio. And it's available to the people there. Yeah, I, I have two, two different, different questions. questions. Yeah. I just would like to put it right now. Uh, one is uh, 
how do you do your study group, how many times, or regularity? And two, uh, you're talking about personal religion, and you told us that when you were growing up, your father or your parents bring you to the church every week, right? Yeah, right. Now that you have this personal religion, how do you transmit that to your family? Do you still do that, or in what form? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, first, first, our group it, it gets together. We, our group is five years old. Uh, there were moments that were only two or three of us, mainly Sweetie, my wife, and somebody else. Uh, but we, we remain there doing the meetings every week, and today we are about 12 or 15 in our group. It's a growing group. We do our meetings every Mondays at 7.30, and it takes two hours. And we have also a transmission through the Zoom, so anyone in Brazil can participate of our meeting. So sometimes we have some few uh, participants, and sometimes we have none, but uh, the, the meeting is there. Besides that, we record our meetings, and we put that on the YouTube um, specific channel, where people can uh, see what we have discussed for a period of time. Normally, we, we keep a chronological reading of the group, so we, we follow it in the order. Once in a while, we set up a topic, a selected topic elected by the group, to perform a presentation about that specific topic, such as personality, for instance, or any other. So, and that helps people understanding better several things on the subject we're discussing. So this is our group, but there are several other groups in Brazil. Every day on the week we have a Zoom meeting at the association. We have a Zoom room, so every day is of the week, and sometimes two times or three times a day. Uh, so the other question was about... Uh, how, do you, I, I still, how do you do the... Okay. How, how do you yeah. Someone once told me, look, the only way I can teach uh, religion to my children is, is, is going to a church. Now, if I don't go to a church, it's very tough to talk about God to my children. Well, we have a different concept. Uh, uh, we, I do with my kids do, today are adults. My, I have my grandchildren. So I always talk to them saying, look at the sun, how it's beautiful today. Our Father God has done that uh, sun for us. Look at the flower that's done by our Father. Look at that dog, beautiful dog. You know, so, and be happy you are his daughter or his son. So we talk about God every single opportunity we have. And we talk about God among our children, Sueli and myself, every day, every single day. Doesn't matter if they listen or not, if they care or not, if they like or not, they hear about God. Yeah. I, send, I send them a message that I take from the Urantia book every single day. That's when I start the day. Good morning. Here goes the message now. <laughs> so, sometimes they reply. Some, sometimes they say, you are getting boring. So, so you, you, you should stop. Are you a minister or whatever? No, but I don't mind. So, it's, it's, it's no. And we when stay together. We pray together for the meals. We, we, we stay together and... Uh, we, we talk about God. Sometimes they don't like the escape and go away. But anyway, uh, they know that being with me, is they will hear about the Father. Uh, okay. That's it. Thank you very much. For your thank you all for the patience. Oh, thank you.